chapter 14, good news, bad news. So obviously, probably the start of the chapter, we're going to get some good news, maybe about Jeffrey, um, or about things going on in Stephen's life, and then sadly we'll get some bad news. If you think about it, past a certain point, drum lessons are a complete waste of money. You go there and some guy listens to you playing a couple of book exercises and jamming to a few CDs. Then he assigns you a new book, exercises, and CDs, and your mom pays him $20 for the hour. Next, you repeat as necessary for a bunch of years. So I realized one day that, hey, I had all the drum books and CDs I could ever need, and I could assign myself the next two pages of each book every week. All I had to do was bag my drum lessons, and I'd be saving the family 80 bucks a month. Another time that he's showing that he's caring, he's trying to think about ways he can help his family, even if it's him sacrificing. So rather than being selfless or selfish, he's starting to show that he's turning to be a little more selfless. Just like Mrs. Galley said, why don't you try working on the things you can change? And as we're talking about signposts, that's definitely something that's through, going through his head and we keep hearing it again and again. So I think signpost wise, we'd be again and again, it's important. The author keeps bringing it up because it's in Stephen's mind. But how do you tell this to a drum teacher after five years together? This wasn't just any old drum teacher either. Mr. Stoll had attended every single one of my school concerts since I'd started lessons. He had invited me to probably 10 of his gigs to watch him play, and I had once let me sit on drums at a big band concert for a thousand people. At the time, I had just been terrified, but later, I figured out how amazingly cool that had been of him. So I couldn't just stop showing up. I needed a grand gesture to soften the blow, and I came up with a beautiful one. The day of the last lesson came, and I asked my mom to drop me off a few minutes early and to let me pay Mr. Stoll, then meet her outside at the end. I hadn't told the rents anything about this plan and didn't want to take any chances of Mom and Mr. Stoll talking that day. I had shoved something into my stick bag before leaving the house and was all ready for action. So I went in, we exchanged pleasantries, and I even got through a few exercises before Mr. Stoll noticed I was all sweaty and shaky. What's wrong, kid? Well, uh, I have some bad news. What, did you get kicked out of all city or something? Worse. Is it about your brother? Not exactly. I, we, my family has a lot of expenses with the hospital thing. And my parents are all worried about money. And I decided I can't have drum lessons anymore. I'm sorry, but we can't afford it. And I can't pay. And I'm sorry. You said that already, kid. I did? I'm sorry. There you go again. I, well, I brought you something. Let me just get it. I reached into my bag and pulled out Mr. Stoll's gift. I kept it behind my back for a moment and said, Look, you've really been like a, um, like a mentor to me. You've taught me more than I could ever have imagined. I wanted to give you something to remember me by. So anyway, here it is. And I held the special sticks out to him. You remember the ones that Cutter Buford of the Dave Matthews Band, my drumming idol, signed for me? The ones Jeffrey used to stir his dangerous pie? Kid, those are your prized possession. Taking those would be like kicking you when you're down. Listen, how about we just... Look, from now on, your lessons are free. Don't worry about it. It's my pleasure to help my best student out. Really? You really mean it? Yeah, I do. Now let's get back to work. We were on page 17 of the rudiment book, right? Yes, sir. Oh, one more thing. You might want to spray those things with Lysol or something. Is it just me or do they smell like rotten eggs? So if you guys think back to why those drumsticks smell, we think back to chapter one and what Jeffrey did with them and the disgusting mixture or concoction the vocab word was that he came up with. At the end of the lesson, I realized that I couldn't tell my mom that I'd made this deal with Mr. Stoll, so I just ripped up the check she had given me. I knew that in the long run. That was about as useful as duct taping over your car's fuel gauge so you won't run out of gas. What an awesome, awesome simile. So he's saying that ripping up the checks is not going to be a great plan in the long run because his mom's going to find out. Almost like that if you don't want to know that you're going to run out of gas putting a piece of tape over it, you're still going to run out of gas. Such an awesome, awesome simile. I love it. But in the short run, delusion was an easier path than truth. And come on, you have to admit, the deception was all for a good cause. That week after school, we were supposed to have rhythm section rehearsal for all city on Tuesday and Thursday. Our concert was only a month away, and we needed the extra tightening up work. On Tuesday, Annette was absent, so I was the only one in our van on the way to the high school. I walked into the high school band room and started setting up the conga drums next to the drum set. Renee's boyfriend Biff was already plugging in on his ga bass guitar. The bass player was tuning up and the senior 
pianist, was warming up with scales. After the cat, the usual round of high pass, high pass, high pass, everyone turned toward the band room door, which was slowly creaking open. Biff called out, you can come in, it's okay. The peasant's fully housebroken. He almost never bites anyone anymore. An arm came through the space between the door and the frame, and an arm encased in a cast, a net's arm. Then we heard her voice. A little help here, anybody? The bass player was closest, so he was trotting over and opened the door all the way. Annette came staggering in. She had been trying to carry a huge folder of sheet music in her, the crook of her injured arm. As Mr. Watrous saw what was going on, he walked over, too, just in time to hear Annette's tale. Here's my folder. I won't be playing in the spring concert. I fell down the stairs in my house last night and broke my arm in three places. They said it won't be better until at least May. I'm sorry. Mr. Watrous looked pretty perturbed by the news. Every teacher in the world has a soft spot for Annette. Plus, the girl's a musical dynamo. He was very kind about it, though. It's okay, Annette. Why don't you come on in and make yourself comfortable and stay for the rehearsal? You can be our critic. Would you dig that? Yes, he was the last man in America who could say dig with a straight face without referring to the process of using a tool to remove dirt from the ground. She didn't look like this was a chance of a lifetime or anything, but she did smile a little then. I had a feeling she would have been crushed to be excluded completely, and this gave her a way to stick around and still feel like she belonged. Sure, thanks, Mr. W. So it seems like this is probably our bad news out of the uh, good news, bad news. We settled down for practice. It must have been hard for Annette, but she watched us play for the next two hours without a break. Occasionally, she'd whisper something to the senior piano player, Mr. Watrous. But other than that, all she did was listen and listen to the music so she wouldn't be able to play. The music she wouldn't be able to play. I, on the other hand, was on fire that day. When I was playing the set, all four limbs just knew what to do without me even having to think. In fact, the less I thought, the better I played. There's this one part of the tune called Satin Doll, where the band stopped dead in a gigantic fill that I typically screwed up at least once per rehearsal. I had tried everything, counting, having Mr. W conduct me through it, not counting, closing my eyes, reading the music, ignoring the music. Things just hadn't clicked. But that day, I didn't even blink an eye. The other instruments dropped out, and the next thing I knew, they came back in. I hadn't even noticed I was playing the solo break part, but I must have nailed it because Mr. W was smiling, and that gave me a little approving nod. It was like one of the Zen Master moments in a movie when the Master suddenly figures out the secret of the universe without trying. Well, okay, it was a little Zen Master moment. Like, maybe when the Master figures out the secret of Phillipsburg, New Jersey. It was still cool, though. I was so far into the zone that even Renee's Arrival in her lycra uniform couldn't throw me off. In fact, for the first time in my life, I didn't even particularly pay attention to Renee. I was just having too much fun playing. The last thing we practiced was the big show finale, Cubana B, Cubana Bop. I got ready behind the congas. Brian shifted the drums around a bit so they'd be comfortable for him. He's about a foot taller than me. And Mr. W and Annette came over. They were both going to do the chanting parts they were, that were usually handled by the saxophone section. And Mr. W was going to play the screaming trumpets too. Part 2. This piece had been pretty rough in practice so far, but some days you just click. We were super tight through the whole tune. Brian was playing the kit so well that I felt like we were telepathic. It was as if my right hand and his right foot were wired to one brain. The bass player was locked in there also, so every walking quarter note he played was pulsing in the exact time with Brian's left foot hi-hat clicks. Meanwhile, Biff played an astounding solo. The notes just seemed to shimmer in the air like floating fire. Mr. W was simply incredible. The piano player didn't know this part as well as Annette did, even though he usually played more than half of the show. This one was rightfully hers, but he rose to the occasion too. At the end, we all just stopped and looked around in these massive, dumb-looking grins on our faces. Then Renee started clapping, and Mr. D w joined in. Maybe Annette would have clapped too, if not for the cast, but from the pain look behind her, eye, her smile, I wasn't too sure. On the way home in the van, Annette told me the whole arm story. Then she asked how Jeffrey was doing which I thought was amazing. Here she was with a limb all mangled and her piano career, career slammed into reverse gear, worrying about my brother. I swear, I sometimes, I just feel like pinning a medal on that girl. Anyway, I told her about the whole money situation, even about how I had tried to quit drum lessons. She looked impressed that I had been willing to sacrifice my lessons and thought it was hilarious that the special stick still smelled weird. Naturally, being Annette, she did feel the need to warn me about how ripping up my mom's checks wasn't going to work forever. But somewhere in the preceding half year, I'd figured out 
that the lectures were just an inept thing. In fact, I would nearly have been disappointed if she hadn't given me the big, fiery speech at that point. When we got to my house, we said a sad little goodbye, but I felt cheerful in a way. Evidently, you could shatter Annette's arm, but you couldn't break her spirit. And chapter 15, Close Shaves in an Unfair World. All right, see you later.